you do. Thankful for the basket. I mean, I, that was just so neat to get a basket full of, uh, of goodies. And uh, Lanny and I have been, have been enjoying them uh, in the evenings, a little snack. I uh, want to really uh, thank you for the hospitality that you show each one of the, the speakers. You make us always feel so welcome and so appreciated. And so we're, we're thankful. And there, there are people uh, that are not here this year that have, that, uh, have been years gone by. And, you know, some of the preachers are, are, are not here. But uh, the Anderson family, you know, uh, Dale, Sue, and, uh, and Aiden. Uh, Kathy only came with me one year for a youth rally. And she uh, bonded with several ladies in this congregation. And Sue was one of those ladies. And so I, I, I'm sorry that they're, that they're not able to be here, but certainly they're, uh, they're in our thoughts and in our prayers as well. So we're, we're, we're going to be talking from a text from 1 Peter chapter, and, oh, let me just mention the Williams family. I mean, I, they, uh, they feed us, they, they fed us every day, uh, two days in a row. And, you know, uh, so I, I don't know how you can get past uh, uh, the Williams family and all they do, their children, their grandchildren. Uh, you know, usually we play basketball. And uh, so, uh, you know, I haven't, uh, wasn't able to play this year. But when I get back home, I'm going to tell the physical therapist, this is her goal, to get me ready to play basketball next September. <laughs> so we'll see. We've already got a game plan, so it's going to be one way or the other. We're going to get out there and have, have some fun. But anyway, uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 23. You know, every, every weekday morning at 9 o'clock, this is the text going to be used in a variety of ways. And, uh, of course, uh, the topic uh, of this hour will be uh, watch, watch your tongue. But here, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should f follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him uh, that judgeth righteously." Now, Jack wanted me to do this in two parts. He, you know, told me what to say. Uh, he wanted me to preach uh, when silence is not an option. And uh, the second part of that is uh, uh, how to respond to personal uh, attacks. Now, you know, that <laughs> that's not true. Only Jack. And finally, I got him to come out of the office. <laughs> that's, not, that's not true. Jack never, he never tells, uh, he assigns you a topic and he trusts in you to do it, uh, do it the right way. He can always rescind that offer, and I know that. And he may after this lesson, who knows? But, uh, but he allows the preachers to, uh, to go ahead and, and put the, the lesson together as, uh, as they see fit just trusting uh, that they'll do a, a job that is scriptural and uh, in, in a way that would be encouraging, challenging in some way. And uh, I appreciate the, the confidence that they have in us, and I, we respect that confidence, and we'll, we'll do the very best that we can. You know, Jesus certainly uh, faced more than his, his share of, uh, of persecution, uh, despite the, uh, the teaching, the miracles, the wonders, and the signs showed by him to be the Son of God, it seemed like it brought out the ugliness of those who felt threatened by him. And uh, so they, for a while, if they could, they ignored him. And uh, when that failed, they decided that they were going to go ahead and, and try to trap him in his own words. They were going to use uh, uh, their best arguments, arguments that no doubt they have used over the years. And uh, so they were going to bring those to Jesus to see uh, how he responded to those. Matthew 22 is the chapter. You know, the Herodians were, uh, were those Jews that were loyal to Herod. Uh, they came with the old uh, uh, taxing question, you know. The tax man come up. How many, how many of you like the tax man? I mean, do you, any of you like paying taxes? Do any, any of you like paying taxes? I can speak for me as a preacher, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's ugly. You know, we pay 14% uh, Social Security tax. Do you know that? You know why? They consider us to be self-employed. I say, are you kidding me? I have more bosses than you can shake a stick at. Self-employed? I don't think so. Uh, but they get the old pastor concept, you know, from that, and so they, uh, they, uh, they go ahead and, uh, and tax us. One year, and, I, and I'll, I'll make this brief because I, I have a lot to say. Uh, I had an accountant do my taxes, and, and I found where he made a mistake. And the IRS uh, passed it over, and they didn't catch it either. 
So I called her. I called him. I said, listen, uh, you know, he made a mistake and he should have. And she pulled it up the form. She says, you're right. I said, okay, I'm going to write you a check and send it. She said, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to have to refile that again. A corrective uh, form. I said, well, since I called you, <laughs> I said, surely you won't, you won't uh, give me uh, uh, interest in penalties. He says, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And so they said, so not only did I turn myself in, I had to pay extra money to do it. And uh, so, uh, so uh, of course, I love the IRA, IRS, but, you know, uh, yeah. So anyway, he, they come with this, uh, with this coin, and, you know, the Jews didn't like to pay taxes, uh, especially to the Roman government. And so when Jesus perceived their hypocrisy, he said, uh, show me the image. And, uh, and they did, and, and, uh, and then he took that from... Uh, uh, Caesar, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar, unto God the things uh, that are God. They listened, they marveled, and they went their way. Then came the Sadducees with their question about a woman who was married to seven brothers, all attempting to bring uh, seed to the first one. And you know what makes this uh, ironic is the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in angels. They didn't believe in a spirit in Acts 23 and, and verse 8. So you can see... Uh, you can see uh, I mean, the hypocrisy is just blatant. And, uh, and so uh, Jesus, realizing that, uh, he answers that question in a way. I love the way he answered. He said, you err, or err, <clears throat> not knowing the Scriptures nor the power, uh, the power of God. For in the resurrection they are neither given in marriage uh, or marriage or given in marriage. And, uh, and so then as he's getting into the, this, the thought that he wants them to understand, he's going to go ahead and impress them a little bit by addressing their unbelief. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read, that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of, of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, very much dead physically, alive spiritually. And so he wants us to understand that when we pass from this life to the next life, it's not an end, it's a beginning. Just another plane, we just go into another plane. And so lastly, the Pharisees came with what is the greatest commandment. And of course, Jesus answered, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. Uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. And, uh, and then after they were finished with their questions, he says, now I have a question for you. And uh, he kind of turns to table, he's going to check them to see if they're honest. And he says, Christ, whose son is he? And they said, well, he's the son of David. Now, Jesus is going to be quoting from Psalms 110 and verse 1. He said, then how did David in spirit uh, say, uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. If David called him his Lord, how was he a son? And you know, they, they, they refused it. Like, well, they couldn't answer that. One, one they could recognize uh, uh, his humanity, but to acknowledge the second would have been to admit his deity, and they absolutely refused uh, to do that. So now what have we seen? I, I just want, watching your tongue does not mean letting truth be abused by those who uh, claim to be religious or for, from anybody else uh, for that matter. When Jesus was attacked personally, he did not respond in kind, and we're going to touch on that in a moment. But when it came to truth, he was the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5 and verse 5. And heaven forbid, brethren, that we should ever be ashamed of Jesus and his teaching. You know, the Bible says that if we're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of us in Mark 8 and verse 38. So uh, we are soldiers, and I, I, you know that, and I know that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. For no man that warth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. When you become a soldier of Jesus Christ, there is no surrender. There is no retreat. There is no turning your back on the enemy. The Christian armor in Ephesians 6 tells us that much. Just touching on a couple of things that we are facing in, uh, in our day. I, I don't know if the United States is turning into Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know. But you know why? I, the public schools are... are, <clears throat> are a part of the problem. I don't. Have you ever heard of uh, of, uh, uh, <clears throat> of uh, gender fluid? Have you, have you ever heard of that word gender fluid? Do you know what that means? You can be a boy today, a girl tomorrow. Go back and forth as uh, and as many times as you want to, as however that fits you. 
and the school is advancing that agenda and encouraging kids to do that. Why do you, why you suppose we have so many kids in school today who don't know who they are? <laughs> we need to be preaching, brother. When they do that, we just need to, to turn up the volume, turn up the volume, not be quiet for heaven's sakes, but let's turn up the volume. And uh, one good brother mentioned Candace uh, Owen. And she made a statement one time, and I, I was telling him about it yesterday. And uh, mothers keep coming up to her and asking her, what, what can we do? Our, our kids are being taught this in school. They're being taught this in school. And she says, what do you do when a predator comes after your child? In other words, yank them out, homeschool them, send them to a private school. <clears throat> or, if you can't do that, if you can't afford that, then raise the volume with that school until you're, you're heard or your voice is heard. That stuff cannot be allowed to pass. You just can't let it go. You just can't let it, let it go. Children are being affected wholesale, if you please. ESV, I, I just have a minute for the ESV, you know. Uh, it seems to be the, the darling of the brotherhood these days. You know, we love so many strange things. And this is one of those strange things that we, uh, uh, that we love. It comes out of Fried Hardeman, though it doesn't, that's not the only place that it comes out of, uh, uh, to be sure. And uh, <clears throat> we've, we've had it uh, come into Vail Road and, and had a great deal of discussion. Someone said, Jay's not going to like it because... It takes oh, the only begotten uh, out, of, uh, out, of, out of the Scriptures, and it puts God's only Son. Do you know monogenes? You know, you know, mono means only. What about the genes, G-E-N-E-S? What does that mean? Well, they leave it untranslated. They just don't say anything about it. So they put God's only Son, which is not true. <laughs> it's true. We are uh, the adopted sons of God. But listen to what he says in 1 John 3, 1. <laughs> Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Now listen, that, so if you say Jesus is God's only son, that's not true. So they take out truth. There's five times, in fact, in the New Testament. John is the one who puts it in each one of those as Jesus being the only begotten son of God. John 1, 14, John 1, 18, John 3, 16, John 3, 18, uh, and then 1 John 4, verse 9. Five times he refers to Jesus as being the only begotten son of God. We fought that battle with the NIV. And now we have it coming in with the uh, ESV, and all of a sudden the band say, oh, well, that's okay. Since when does that become okay? One, one other little item, and I don't intend to do an expose of the, the whole, the whole uh, translation. But in Genesis 3, uh, 3.15, where they speak of the seed of the woman, they change that to the offspring of a woman. Now, at the bottom of the page, They'll, they'll say Hebrew seed. In other words, they acknowledge that the Hebrew word is seed. But they opted to change it. In other words, God made a mistake. He shouldn't have put seed there. So we're going to change it. We're going to put offspring. Who do these people think they are? You know, when it comes down to a translation, you want someone to take a Hebrew word, give you the English equivalent, a Greek word, give you the English equivalent, and leave your thinking out of it. I'll decide, I'll decide that for myself. Who are these folks? I mean, who do they think they are? Well, it comes from Crossway, you know, which is uh, an offspring of the Baptist church, and they put the doctrine in Romans 10 and verse 10. You, they have you saved by faith only. So listen, uh, I don't care which colleges push it, which ones advance it. Uh, that's not, that's not a, a reliable translation, and we ought to say that no matter where we are. And I hope I trust that, that, you'll, uh, that, you'll, that you'll do that. You know, the suffering Jesus, okay. He's an example for us to follow. You know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. You know, I mean, uh, I, I, Jesus didn't say those exact words. I, I, you know that. But he, in a, in a way, displayed them. You know, the Jews said that he was a Samaritan and had a devil in John 8 and verse 48. Boy, what a double insult. You know, he's a Samaritan, which they hated, and, he's, and he has a devil. I mean, that's really kind of uh, uh, is about as, as ugly as it can be. Others said he's a devil and he's mad in John 10 and verse 20. Guilty of blasphemy in John chapter 10, verse 33. So the Jews who accuse Jesus of these things, you know, they're uh, basement dwellers. And hang on, hang on to that thought. They lived in the mud, and they wanted to drag Jesus into the mud with them, and he refused to go down to their level. Yet, uh, the night of his betrayal and the day of his crucifixion, the enemies of Jesus were in, 
rare form. They were. The ugliness is on full display for you and I uh, to see. They spat in his face. Now, you know, I try to, I try to, uh, uh, to be as uh, Christ-like as I can be. I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I don't think I could respond the way that he did with someone spitting in my face. I, I don't know. That would be a hard thing uh, to put up with and not respond in some way. Uh, they slapped him. You know, uh, I, I think that's such an insult to us men. It would be better if he punched him. But to slap him, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a, an insult uh, of, of itself. <clears throat> they wanted to kill him so bad. You know, but they needed the Romans to help carry that out. They couldn't do that by themselves. And so they brought in false witnesses who provide evidence at the trial and they didn't find anything that they could use. And so they started to press him. Oh, tell us, are you the Son of God? You know, in Mark chapter 14 and verse 62, Jesus says, I am. Now, you know, I, have you ever heard people say, Jesus never said that he was the Son of God? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He, and he didn't, say it, he didn't say it in so many words in John 8 and verse 58. But when he said that uh, before Abraham was, I am, the Jews knew what he was saying. They picked, up, they picked up rocks and they were going to stone him to death. And so they knew what he was saying. They understood what he was saying. And so, uh, so Jesus, uh, uh, he, he let them know uh, that that wasn't the case. And then on the cross, they continued to mock and ridicule him. Psalms 22 is one of those chapters that we, uh, that we go to often. And I, I know that you know it. Uh, but uh, this was written uh, by David, a shepherd boy who became a king a thousand years before the events, before crucifixion was ever practiced as a means of capital punishment. In Psalms 22, verse 7 and 8, it talks about how they're going to ridicule him on the cross. Uh, verse 16, they pierced his hand and fit the gamble for his garments in verse 18. But in Psalms 22 and verse 1, he would cry out and say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know what? It, it, you know, when you read that passage, and I want to I want to add a couple more and then present it for 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 your consideration. In the back of chapter 1 and verse 13, it says that God is of pure rise and look upon sin. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, it says, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Could it be, could it be, brethren, that when Jesus took upon him the sin of the world, that God couldn't look on him? Is that why he cried out and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I just thought I'd just present that for you to, for you to think about. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Then they say they said he saved others he, uh, himself he cannot save, and that's absolutely true. He couldn't save he couldn't save himself and save others as well. I wonder what you would have said had you been there on that day. Jesus is on the cross. Well, not even even before that, when they're crying out saying crucify him, crucify him. What would you have said, Keith? What would you have said? What would you have said while the mob was crying out crucify him, crucify him? I, I'm confident that that it, knowing what we know today, if we would have been in that crowd, we wouldn't have said anything. We'd have been weeping. We'd be looking. But inside, inside, we'd be saying, yeah, crucify him, crucify him. That's the only way I can live. I wonder if we could put ourselves in, in, the, in, that, in that crowd on, on that day. So uh, he, he, he cannot say, he saved others that cannot say, that's absolutely true. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, for he said, I am the Son of God. He didn't, he didn't respond. He, he, uh, he who trusts in uh, God, who judges righteously, he didn't, respond to, he didn't respond to that in kind. But God did. <laughs> Not in words, uh, to be sure. But in action, uh, God, was, God was speaking out on that occasion. And even those who had uh, no, uh, no dog in the race, so to speak, you know, they didn't have any... They didn't have one way or another, the centurion and those that were with him. <clears throat> and so uh, three hours of darkness, and the fulfillment of Amos 8 and verse 9. And the veil uh, in the temple rent from the top to the bottom. The earth that quaked and the graves uh, were opened. 
Now, you know, we, we talked about translation. Here's a, here's a couple of seconds for me to talk about uh, the NIV. Oh, trust the NIV. You know that the NIV has uh, the graves open and them coming out of the grave but not appearing into the city till after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you know that robs him of the distinction that is given to him by God Almighty? Do you know that? That he's the firstborn, first begotten, uh, the first fruits of them that slept. Now, let me give you a, a passage for each one of those, though you can get the tape later. <clears throat> uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, Colossians 1, 18, Revelation 1, 5. And so they rob Jesus of that distinction uh, because uh, they have them coming out of the grave uh, before uh, uh, before Jesus was resurrected. I, and that's just a, a tip on one of those things. So anyway, uh, the centurion uh, got that message, and it says that they feared greatly and said, truly this was the Son of God. God judges righteously. Jesus is our example of suffering. He refused to be a, uh, a basement dweller. He wouldn't even visit the basement. <laughs> and so that's the way we ought to be when people uh, approach us. Uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't let anybody else pull him down to their level. Two boys were arguing. And one of the boys called the other one a bookshelf. He said, you're a bookshelf. And so a little boy went running to his mother. He said, so-and-so called me a bookshelf. You know, it could have it could have ended there. You know, the mom could have said, well, if you're a bookshelf, then you're a good-looking bookshelf. No, she said, go back and call him a window. And so he went back and he called him a window. So for the next, uh, they were... Uh, they were uh, changing insults, trying to make uh, 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 the other one less than they were. I don't, I don't know. Can I call you a bookshelf? Can I, can I call you? Would you be, would you be insulted? Uh, he, I, I'm gonna, I have started, and uh oh, you're in, you're in the hot seat there, buddy. So if I called you a bookshelf, would you be, would you be angry? What if I said, listen, you have a terrible voice. Will you please tone it down a little bit? Will you, will you tone it down a little bit? Now, you could say that to me, and, uh, and it would be true. I, I haven't told this story uh, uh, in, in years, but uh, when I was in school, you know how you go to the music class, and the music teacher goes by, she goes by each one of the, you're all singing the same song, she'll come by and she'll lean down and she'll listen to you to tell you where, where you belong. So when she came to me, she leaned down and she says, just move your lips, honey. <laughs> so when you say when you say uh, Jay can't sing, listen, I say I, I agree. <laughs> so you're not going to insult me uh, if you say that. What would somebody have to say to you to make you quit? What would they have to say to you to make you quit? I'm so offended, I'm quitting. You know, it doesn't take much for some folks. You know, it doesn't take much. You know, those who come uh, periodically, they come uh, they come in with a chip on their shoulder. You know, and Preacher, if you say something that offends me, uh, I'm leaving, and I offend very easily. So, you know, you can say almost anything, and you can offend somebody. What would it take to make you stop? There was this lady, and uh, she was in this congregation, and whenever she would come up to you, and she was, she was wringing your hands, and she says, oh, I love so-and-so, I just don't know what to do. When, when she said that, you knew somebody was going to get it. She used the word love like we do on Thanksgiving when we're about ready to carve up the turkey, you know. So, but I'll give this woman this. She loved about everybody in that congregation at one time or another. And so she would always have, a, and you know, there's a passage. in uh, 1 uh, uh, Peter 2, verse 16. It says, not using Christianity as a cloak of maliciousness. It doesn't give you a right to be mean. It doesn't give you a right to, uh, uh, to cut up on somebody or whatever happened. And I... And, uh, and uh, so I would take whatever she said as a grain of salt and never, never pay a bit of attention to it. Not pay, not to, no, I wouldn't pay a, uh, any attention uh, to that at all. We had, we had one young fellow, and uh, he was uh, zealous as can be. He said, but if I saw you come out of Pizza Hut, I would assume you were drinking beer. I said, now, why would, why would you make that assumption? I mean, I, I, never, I never look at things in the worst possible way. I always look at things in the best possible light. I, you, always, you, always give, you always give the benefit of a doubt. But if it really bothered me, I would go and ask that brother about it. But to, to make that blanket statement, that means, that, that means if you went to Kroger's, I'm going to assume that you come out of there with a bottle of wine because Kroger sells it. 
I mean, how do we, how do we jump, how do we make those jumps to where those things are, aren't? So in the very next verse, in 1 Peter 2, verse 17, it says, love the brotherhood. Now here's the attitude, and then, uh, then I'm done. <clears throat> when someone says something uh, bad about you, you can always say, I'm sorry, I don't live in the basement. I won't visit there either. I don't look good in mud. And so, you know, you don't have to go down there. You don't have to roll around with them. You can refuse to go down and roll around with them. And you can commend yourself unto him who judges righteously. Thank you. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Well, uh, somebody's supposed to come up here, so I can, I'll get a chance to tell you. Uh, you know, I could have introduced myself. You know, I, I didn't need him. You know, but you know that I'm the best-looking preacher on the lectureship, and the most humble. <laughs>